Good morning and welcome to Sonnenberg Mennonite Church. I hope you all enjoyed the nice day of warm weather followed by some cold temps. I told one of the teachers at school, I felt like God was teasing us. She quickly corrected me by saying, not teasing, but blessing. I reflect on the week sitting in EMT class for the first time feeling overwhelmed. What did I get myself into? And more impulsively, is it too late to run? The theme of trusting God came to mind, and rightfully so with this week's passage. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your paths acknowledge him and he will... In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. What ways have you had to trust God this week? I invite you to stand as Martha leads us into our singing. Please turn in your blue hymnal to 514. We're going to start with, Lord, I am fondly, earnestly longing. Um, this is a great song for the themes of this Sunday and just a good song for any Sunday. Um, so we're going to sing all three verses um, with Pam Helby. And then turn over to 356, asking for God's presence here in this service. 356. Um, we're going to sing all together on the first. We'll let the women take the lead on the second, men take the lead on the third, and all together again on the fourth.
invite the children to come forward for children's. We have a full bench. They asked me to share something that I do during church with you, and that's um, what I do with this book. Um, I, I started one time, I had some papers from Sunday school that had some colors on them, and during church I doodled on it. And I found out I paid better attention to the sermon if I was drawing some things about it. And so I just kept doing that. And now I have this book that is my, I, it's my Sunday church sketchbook. I have other sketchbooks, but this one is the one I use on Sundays when I come to church. And this Sunday we're also celebrating communion, which is also something that we do to remind ourselves that we're part of a church family. And this book also reminds me, and in addition to the sermons, it reminds me of my church family because sometimes I have little things in here that remind me of, of you guys here. So I thought I'd show you some pictures, but you might have to come closer because these are pretty tiny sketches, so maybe just scooch closer here. Um, on this page, I don't know if you can see, but there's a little tiny round circle ahead and a body there. Do you see that? That is actually Nate Holton holding Will. And if you look here, there's somebody giving somebody a hug here. That was Jeremy, and his son was giving him a little bit of a hug there, Jeremy Patterson. Yeah, that, that sermon... That sermon was about Palm Sunday when Jesus came riding on a donkey. So there's palm leaves and there's a donkey. This Sunday here was the first time that Glenn preached, and he told us that he likes, what does he like to eat? Do you remember what that is? It's a Swiss roll. So I put it, in, it looks like a cinnamon roll, doesn't it? I've eaten cinnamon rolls. <laughs> Sometimes I just have colors, and I sketch on top of the colors, and sometimes I draw pictures, and then later I color them. But this was when I was outside. Sometimes when we worship outside, I would, you know, a little bug came and sat on me, and so I drew a picture of the bug. That's the bug. Yeah. Then this was the Sunday that the MYF came and talked. They talked about swaps, so if you look at the back of Jesse's shirt, he has this hammer and paintbrush on the back of his shirt. That's what their shirts all had. And I didn't have anything painted that day, so I just drew a picture of the MYF. So there's, there's Chip. Does anybody know who Chip is? Yeah. And Bra uh, uh, Braden wasn't there, and so they had to put his picture up on the wall. So he's up on the wall. Can you tell who's sitting in the pew here? It's the back of their heads, but can you tell who it is? Somebody who sits up front a lot and maybe has some white hair. Maybe this, this is Gordy. This is Lorene. Then this Sunday was a baptism Sunday when Braden got baptized. And it looks like I got a bunch of water pouring on him, don't I? Sometimes I like the songs. And so this one, I, I actually took the song and taped it in here because I liked it so much. Sometimes I, some of you bring me your toys, and I sketch your toys. This is Adam's dino, and that Sunday in Adam's pocket, he also had a little round toy with spikes on it, and I'm told that is his toy coronavirus. <laughs> and we did a My Queen's Count there. I made one of my circles into a penny there. Do you see that? And let's see. This Sunday was Jeremy was preaching on um, what it's the sh the great shepherd of the sheep and how a pastor is like a shepherd. And this has all the sheep. I drew them as sheep. And 
It was right before Glenn was going to start coming to preach, and so I put all the names of his family on the sheet, too. So, Karis, there's your name. So, let's see. One time he preached on Coat of Many Colors with Joseph, and I was glad I had lots of different colors here so I could do the coat. I can paint very well. You paint very well? I believe it. I, I believe it. Let's see. This one he preached on Jesus the King and um, all <coughs> King David and things like that. And there's a bunch of, looks like a crown and a shield there, I thought. Sometimes I just look for patterns. Do you see this little pattern here? That was, Bar that was Barb Ressler's earring. <laughs> hmm. This was also Adam's pocket. Uh, that Sunday he had a dinosaur and a spider and a little hamster. I don't have any hamsters. And then we, this was Advent Sunday, so we had candles. Do you remember when Glenn looked dressed up like John the Baptist? And I just drew him as John the Baptist. And let's see. One time Karis sat beside me and I drew her toys. This is Opal and this is Carrie or Kelly. This time we had flowers in Sunday school one time and I drew those. And this is last Sunday's sermon and in Sunday school we talked about cast your cares upon the Lord so I drew a picture of that. This Sunday I haven't drawn anything yet and I wondered if you could help me this Sunday, when we celebrate communion, we take grape juice and bread to represent God's, um, Jesus' blood and his body, and the grape juice comes from grapes, and I wondered if you could, I'm going to have each of you stamp your finger with purple and be grapes in my sketchbook for me. Would that okay. be okay? I, I also stamp. have something to give you. So I thought you guys also might like to do a little sketching, so I made little tiny sketchbooks for you, and I put some colors in it you can doodle on. And then on, like the, the, on the back side, I did one of my favorite things. My parents are here today, and one of the things they used to do for me in church is they would draw a little line, and then I would have to turn it into something. That's so there's I'm some... Do they? Do you? So there's some little lines on these books for you to do, too. And I thought I didn't put anything on the front because I thought you could put your name on there or something so you'd know it was yours. And if there's extra books at the end, I'll put them back in the creativity corner, and you can use them other Sundays. So I'm going to get this purple paint out, and it, you'll have to push your finger really hard on it, and then you'll stamp your finger in my book. And when you're done, you're going to go over to Rachel. She has wet wipes to wipe your finger off. And she has these little books that you can take one back with you to your bench. So once you get the little book, you can head on back. Okay? So let's That's my cat. get some purple I got out. A kitten. I, got a, I have a kitten. You have a kitten. I might have to draw that one in here today. You know, can I use your finger? Push it really hard. Now push it somewhere on there. Good job. Now go wipe your finger. Go push it somewhere on here. Good job. Good job. Thank you. It's going to be so much fun to have you all in my book. Good job. Boy, you got lots of them there. All right, go wash your finger, and you can take your book back. There you go. You did? Is it all gone? I don't think so. You don't think so? Keep rubbing. Thank you. Is there anybody that didn't get your finger in my book? Do you want your finger in my book? I will trade you. There you go. It might leave a little purple on your hand, but it won't rub off on your clothes that way. 
you can take your book and go back to your seat. If you draw in it, you can show me it sometime. I'd love to see your books too. Will, do you want a book? I get to say where do I oh, where's your kitten? I didn't get one. Yeah. Okay, do you want more? I already. You did? Yeah. Okay. It was really, really nice. Go back. I'll go back to this book. Do you want one? Here's a book. Here, I need some books. You want a book? Do you have a book? Grace and peace from God, in the name of God, in the name of Jesus, in the name of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Bethany, for the call to worship this morning highlighting our annual scriptural theme for today and for the year. Thank you, Michelle, for sharing your creativity and the thumbprint of each child for you to help your doodling this morning. I, I just see that as like the little thumbprints of God's blessing. I have appreciated your doodling so much. A number of my sermons that have been illustrated and I've asked for some copies, and they're hanging in my office, and she's even framed some for me. It has meant so much. Thank you for sharing your creativity. And also thank you, Michelle, too, for the work that you've done on our door, our Ebenezer, that is reminding, of us, reminding us of our journey, of the restoration process that we experienced during Advent. I want to extend another special welcome to any visitors we have this morning. Michelle, it's nice to have your parents with us. Um, also down in Mabel, I noticed your son, Bill, I met, is here, and I won't put anyone else on the spot, but welcome to any other visitors that are here this morning. Uh, this has been a long-awaited Sunday. Um, I've been anticipating celebrating communion for, well, five months I've been here now. We didn't take it in the fall together as a congregation when we had the joint worship at Central during the Fall Communion Sunday, um, World Communion Sunday, when we were at Central for that joint worship, and I, and I was, had this tinge of regret that I hadn't celebrated communion, wondering when we we're going to do it. And then three weeks ago, I was planning to have this time of welcoming new members and leading communion, and my dad passed. And I was still planning on trying to get back here Saturday night after my dad's celebration of life service until I realized, what am I doing? I think there's a little bit too much going on. And this past, there's a lot that has transpired in the last month or so. I'm thinking back to Christmas. Do you remember Christmas? It, it, was, it was weird. We did not have service. We did not meet for Christmas. And I had strep throat that week. And then I preached January 1st and 8th, and the 8th was Epiphany, and that was the last time that I preached. There's been four weeks that I have not stood up here to deliver a sermon. And it's been strange. It's been gracious. It has been very meaningful. I think I've said the word meaningful more times than I have ever remembered saying in the last six weeks. There's been so many things that have transpired. We've heard messages from a number of people. I was planning on, on Greg, Stefan, preaching on baptism the third Sunday of the month when I planned to not be in the pulpit. And when, we were, when he preached on baptism and how we were all in, and that was anticipation of what I was planning to do the next week. But then Dick Barrett came and preached on unity and how we are to be all together as a body. And that was also meaningful. Um, when my dad passed, 
It was that Sunday before when Greg preached. It was that evening. And I had spent four days in Archibald, the last four days of my dad's life. And we had calling hours, and it was very meaningful. And then the next weekend was the celebration of life service, and it was very meaningful. And I wasn't here for worship that following Sunday, but the, the message was on love. And thinking about how my dad loved has been something that has been the most significant for me the last number of weeks, seeing how God loves, how my dad loved, and how if we do not love one another, we do not have God in us. Then Danae King preached Missions Weekend, and that was also significant. And the next week, Terry Shu, the week that I was planning my first week of vacation, being here after five months. And so I, that had been planned on the schedule for a while. And it was a gracious time of being off. This, is, this has been, someone has described my time here as being an all-out sprint. There's been something going on that's been full and meaningful and rich that the last day of the year when Lexi passed, and it was January 1st, 1st, or 4th, having, having that memorial, and during the time when I knew my dad was passing. And we had our annual scriptural theme when we concluded our time of, of restoration of Advent, and we have this image going forth with us for this year, and our new logo that's been, well, it's not that new. It's been the process for this past year, but recently released and, and welcoming new members today, uh, a dozen of them. And we ha- welcomed six just this, this summer. The Chosen concluded. The episodes of episode six, I don't know if I shared Uh, a testimony that I want to share that was so impactful for Aaron and I watching that that night. I remember it was depicting a lot of Jesus' miracles. And I was so moved by, by that episode of Jesus healing people and praying for people and people's lives being changed and seeing the world in a new way. And uh, something that I want to share that I had on my heart was praying for Kathy Gerber. And I just was overwhelmed with watching this episode. And, and some of you may be getting to know Mark and Kathy Gerber. They've recently been coming. They're going to be joining this morning virtually. So hello, Mark and Kathy. They are going to be welcomed in new, as new members from home. So Kathy's been dealing with a number of things since her car accident and had a concussion, and then with Lyme disease, there are a number of things that can be overwhelming, whether it's even light or social interactions, so she's not always able to be here at worship. And I had on my heart to pray for her, and the episode no longer than got over, and I look, and I had an email from Kathy. And the timing of that just seemed so, I'll use the word again, meaningful. And this email was Kathy explaining very clearly of a number of the things that she's dealing with. And I just had impressed on my heart, why not, Jesus? Why not pray for healing? And we have yet to get together yet. I'm looking forward to to still, we're planning to get together to meet and pray for healing and anointing, but also can share that her treatment, I think it was even reported in the bulletin, um, is helping and she's showing signs of improvement. So... There is this hopeful process that she is on. One other testimony that I want to share was watching episodes 7 and 8 of The Chosen when Aaron and I went to, to see it in the theater. And we, we went to uh, Longhorn Steakhouse. This was a date that we went on. And we were sitting there in the restaurant. And I remember sharing, and I also shared this testimony and got permission from Henry and Julie to share this I remember sharing with with Aaron at the meal that uh, just how significant it's been walking with Henry and Julie during this last season of the times with their son that has been incarcerated, that it's been very difficult for them. And it's been one of the most sacred journeys for me to walk with them as a pastor. And I shared with Aaron... 
during the meal just how excruciating it is to see when parents can't hug their children. And it had been a long time for a mother to not be able to hug her son. And I shared this before we went in to watch the, the Chosen season finale, episode seven and eight. And before the, the showing was over, I got an email. It was actually a group text from Julie praising God that they were able to meet for visitation for like six hours, I think it was, and they were able to hug and embrace, and it was a whole room full of people, of families being able to be reunited. And I just started crying. I had just shared this. I hadn't talked about this with Aaron much, but to be able to share that, how meaningful, how difficult that had been, and then (laughs) <laughs> Within a couple hours, I'm getting this text saying that, rejoicing that they're, they're, they were able to have this, this reunion. And it was God just in timing. I see God in timing like that. It just meant so much. God has been near. God has been present. Not just in my life, but in all of our lives. Looking over the vast number of weeks, what we all have experienced. How God has shown up in certain ways that you've experienced or give testimony to. Terry Shu spoke on heaven. And he said that he's never really preached on heaven other than usually at funerals. And I've had a number of conversations, a lot of people that are wishing me condolences about my dad. And it's been very meaningful, and the cards have been very meaningful. But what has been so unique is how little I have grieved the passing of my dad and how he he had anticipated and looked forward to heaven and just wanted to go meet Jesus. And it's been on my heart in a number of conversations and people have shared, what do we struggle with here on earth? Why do we try to stick around? We have so many struggles, We, we, we battle against death. And it's not like we need to be looking forward to death, but we do be, we can and should be looking forward to heaven. There is something that awaits us that is so wonderful. It is so wonderful. It is us that are left here with the pain of loss or separation. But for our loved ones and for ourselves, as we anticipate real communion, with our Lord. It is something to anticipate and to rejoice. We, we, we do not long for the death of our loved ones, but we can celebrate in what they are experiencing in glory. Welcoming new members is something that we, we celebrate and before I invite the, the new members that we are welcoming, which Aaron and I are included in this morning, we have not transferred a membership yet, and I don't know what the typical standard procedure is for when a new pastor comes. Uh, I think at Martins Creek, when I was installed, I was handed my certificate. You're a member here. And I don't know if it's because I'm the pastor, I didn't hand myself a certificate when I started here, but Aaron and I are also entering in, or, you know, becoming new members this morning as well with the rest of them. I wanted to go through the pledge and, and discuss the significance of what it is we are doing when we are entering into this commitment and this covenant as members of our body. And it's in your bulletin. If you have a bulletin, you can look and see... There's two parts this morning. There's first the membership pledge. Those of us that are becoming new members, what is this? What's the significance and what's the meaning? Why are we doing this? And as it starts out there, we are reaffirming our faith and our loyalty to Jesus Christ, our Lord, and to the gospel that he proclaimed. And the next part there, how we are willing to unite with this congregation and will worship 
serve, and share in its ministry. I don't think I can highlight the significance of how we worship together. Was it Rhoda just a couple Sundays ago when she was worship leader? She asked, what do you think of when you think of worship? And we shouted out our responses. And most commonly, we think of singing together, offering our, our gifts of singing, of music, when we sing and join our praises together to God. But it's not just when we sing that we worship together. And I will argue that it's in everything that we do, we are worshiping God. In everything that we do, when we acknowledge God in all of our ways, that we are also worshiping. So we, as a body, we worship together corporately. And as we join, we serve together and share in its ministries. And I'm compelled to share the way we do that. How do we minister together? And I started listing all the ways. And if you try to think of all the ways that we do ministry together, who are the ministers of our congregation? It says it on the back of the bulletin. I may be the pastor, but we are all ministers. We all minister and we serve together. And I started listing, and I'm probably going to get in trouble because I'm going to forget something. Whether it is serving in children's ministry or giving a children's lesson, teaching Sunday school, whether it's middle school, high school, or adults, whether you're a venture club sponsor or MYF sponsor, youth, children, kids, you have a role to play. You are to participate in things, in worship. You are also ministering to others. You minister to us. When we had our talent show and Eliza Holton comes up here and says, I'm going to recite a poem that I think you're going to like. Well, I think we were quite blessed, Eliza, from your poem. Thank you for sharing that. You ministered to us by doing that. Everyone has a role. It takes a community to raise a child and equip and disciple. Mentors. Adult ministry, we eat together in fellowship, we play, we pray, Bible study, men's groups, women's groups, Sunday school classes that do life together, small groups that meet and also do life together. We share in joys and in sorrow. Outreach and service, we look beyond ourselves and the walls of this building. We give lots of money to many ministries and organizations all over the world, close and far. We help people, we host people, we send people, we serve alongside one another, and we bring the community together with events like the fish fry and the maple syrup and pancake breakfast, which is coming up in like two months. And that's like the first thing that my family took in that weekend of my candidating weekend. And so I think that meeting that's happening after church today is deciding which week it's happening, the end of April. So that's coming up in like two months, the Pancake and and Syrup Festival. That brings the community together. It draws the community together, and we raise more money for missions and outreach and sending people and helping ministries. The Chicken Barbecue. We support Central Christian School. Bible Quiz. Mennonite Women. Sewing. Nodding and quilting comforters. Cemetery. We bury people. Marry and baptize people. Pastoral team, visitation, caring fund, we send flowers. CLT, the Congregational Leadership Team, we handle business and financial decisions. Facilities, we maintain this building and property. We steward this property and we share this property with a school that meets here. And the many things that happen in this building throughout the week. Of the library, decorating, secretary, treasurer, janitor, food committee, delegates, worship ministry planning, digital arts and sound, meat canning, Sammy Squad, gifts discernment, MDS, Open Arms, Love Inc., a website, which, Jeremy, we need to work on our website. We need to get that up. Lots of things that we do. I'm not even going to ask who I missed but we ministry together. We are all in this together. We support this congregation. 
we commit continuing in the membership pledge there by our earnest prayers, regular attendance, loyal service, and faithful stewardship as God gives us strength. We're invested. We're committed. We have not all churches do the same thing or put the same significance on membership, per se. We have this record. Chip shared this document with me. Starting back in 1991, we have record of all the members of our congregation. And it can, and it's, it's, I just, I read through the entire list, and there's a number of pages of everyone that either joined the church, transferred their membership from somewhere, or it also states when people transfer their membership elsewhere, or when people pass away, or when they're baptized. And it is, it is this running testimony of who has been members of our congregation? Who, what has been the makeup of our congregation? And it, there, and it ebbs and flows. And I'm not concerned about numbers, but the significance is of who we are. And there's also the section in our directory that says friends of Sonnenberg. So you can look and see there's a number of people that are still members, whether they haven't transferred, whether they, they're, they're not here whether they have gone somewhere else, whether they have not requested their membership to be transferred to where they're at. But I am a firm believer that wherever you are, wherever you are worshiping, that's where your membership should be. And not all churches do membership, but this is where you're invested. This is where you are covenanting to do life, to do worship, to do church, and everything that entails together. We are in it together. And it's significant. So I explained, Mark and Kathy are going to participate virtually, so they will also be uh, reciting this pledge. And Don and Mabel, we're going, not going to make Don come up on stage, so they're going to stand right there from, and participate. And so at this time, I'll invite everyone else that is becoming new members to come up on stage and join me. And I'll list who is coming up, besides myself and my wife, Erin. We have Marlon and Kathy Troyer. Don and Mabel Gable, Mark and Kathy Gerber, I said Vince and Joanna Miller, and Noah and Kelly Rains. So if you come up and join me on stage, I will lead us through saying our membership pledge. It will be projected on the screen. It's also in your bulletin that you can read along. And then I'll be passing out, after we recite our membership pledge, then there will be opportunity for you all as a congregation to read and recite together the congregational covenant that's also listed there in the bulletin and will be projected on the screen. All right, new members, let's, and Kathy and Mark at home, and Don and Mabel, all of us together, let's recite this new membership pledge. I affirm my faith in and loyalty to Jesus Christ, our Lord, and to the gospel he proclaimed. I am willing to unite with this congregation and will worship, serve, and share in its ministry. I will support this congregation by my earnest prayers, regular attendance, loyal service, and faithful stewardship, as God gives me strength. As a member, I will live in Christian fellowship with this congregation, giving and receiving love, sharing burdens, and seeking the good of all. All right, and now I invite the congregation to Recite together the Congregational Covenant, and I will lead us in that as well. Together. As we now receive you into the membership of the church, we make this covenant with you, and we renew our own covenant with God. 
we pledge to bear each other's burdens, to assist in times of need, to share our gifts and possessions, to forgive as Christ has forgiven, to support each other in times of joy and sorrow, and in all things to work for the common good, thus proclaiming the presence of Christ among us, so that our lives may glorify God. Holy Spirit, make us one body, part of the church worldwide, united in its diversity now and in every age. Amen. I wanted to give an opportunity for anyone that wanted to share anything in response this morning. So I wasn't going to put you all on the spot and make you, and I'd given them a heads up if they wanted to share, but wasn't going to require that. So is there anyone that is planning to share? All right. We, we met in my office just prior to, and I forgot to ask them if they were planning to, to share. So I will give you your certificates, and then you may sit down. And Mark and Kathy will get theirs. When I was planning this service a few weeks ago, I was thinking about all the elements and how there is so much to do in one service. Thinking about communion, it made sense in my mind to welcome our new members prior to taking communion together. When you think of celebrating communion in the past, what comes to mind? What I remember hearing of times long ago, the ministers would get up week or weeks in advance and say, you must prepare for taking communion. You must get right with your fellow brother and sister. Does anyone remember this? I don't know what all that entailed. I understand that it is difficult to take communion with hate in your heart. If you have someone that you have got a disagreement with, that you were to go and to make things right. Now, I didn't give you a warning, you know, of a week before, of you need to go and make things right. But I invite you in your hearts at this time to pre prepare yourself for communion. Are, are there people in your life that you harbor discontent or even hatred to? Those are the things that, are, that if they are in your heart, the, mas the message that was preached the day after my dad died about having love, that if you do not have love in your heart, you do not have God. If you do not have love for someone else, you do not have God in you. And that was, it seemed pretty profound. If you hate another brother or sister, you do not have God in your times of hate. God is not there. God is not in you if you are hating them. And that stuck with me. So that's what comes to my mind as I'm preparing us for communion the state of our hearts, which is required. When we, when we take communion together, there is this mystery of Jesus' body 
and Jesus' blood being poured out. And I've often wanted to ask the kids how well they understand this. What does that mean? What does it mean to you? Because as many times as I've taken communion, it feels like I still don't fully understand it. And I've come to the grips with thinking, maybe that's okay. How well do we understand what this means? When Jesus celebrated the Last Supper, what were they celebrating? What's the significance? And I'm going to read this passage in Matthew of Jesus celebrating the Last Supper with his disciples. And I encourage you to hone in on the words that Jesus says. What is happening? What would this have meant to the disciples experiencing this? You know, Jesus saying these words, instituting the Last Supper, what did it mean? And what does it mean to you now? Reading from Matthew 26. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? He replied, Go into the city to a certain man and tell him, The teacher says, My appointed time is near. I am going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve. And while they were eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. They were very sad and began to say to him one after the other, Surely you don't mean me, Lord. Jesus replied, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, Surely you don't mean me, Rabbi? Jesus answered, You have said so. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Do you know what they were celebrating? Why were they gathering for the Last Supper? For this supper, Jesus' Last Supper. What was the Passover that they were celebrating? The salvation, Exodus out of Egypt. That's right. People were making this pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Jesus has this Last Supper with his disciples as a Passover celebration, hearkening back to the time of Exodus, of the last plague, before the children of Israel experienced deliverance and salvation from their slavery. The last plague was the death of every firstborn male in Egypt. And the children of Israel were spared by sacrificing a lamb, Blood had to be spilt, and they put the blood over their doorposts as a sign for the destroying angel to pass over and not enter into that household. And that last plague 
was the last sign and the last straw that, fit, that, that brought Pharaoh to allowing the children of Israel to leave. They also ate unleavened bread. They were to eat it while standing up because they were not to let it have time to rise. They were leaving that night. So they celebrated this Passover with having the, the spread of blood over their doorposts, the spilled blood that had to be poured out, and they ate the unleavened bread. So Jews would come to Jerusalem every year. They would pilgrimage, and they would celebrate this. And I love the significance of Jesus coming and celebrating this with his disciples and has them prepare for this Passover. And the time that he is, he is having them prepare this, the next, it happens after, after sundown, and so that's the marking of this next day. The lambs were being slaughtered the same day that Jesus died. And in John's gospel, John doesn't even have the disciples eat a meal together. Jesus is the meal. So Jesus is crucified on the day that all of the Passover lambs were being slaughtered. So Jesus is this atoning sacrifice. Jesus' body that is broken is the bread that we partake. As he's instituting these words of this is my body and this is my blood, the sign of the new covenant, I wonder what went through the disciples' minds. They've celebrated this their whole lives of God's salvation. Now these disciples were the closest ones to Jesus. They knew he was the Messiah. Did they understand the sacrifice that he had to make? They understood sacrifices, probably better than what we understand, sacrifices. But that first time, did they get it, that Jesus was going to be the sacrifice? Now, I've often wondered, when we celebrate communion, the word celebrate sounds like a party. Celebrate or take or receive communion, I've always wondered, should we be sad in remembering Jesus' death? Or should we be celebrating that we have salvation from our sins? And I believe it's both. Communion is often this time that's so solemn. But I encourage you, as you experience communion this morning, whatever stirs in your heart, and it may be remorse, because as we identify with the betrayer that Jesus died for our sins, There's nothing that could give you more remorse than acknowledging we are responsible for Jesus needing to die. But at the same time, there's nothing that brings greater joy than realizing we are set free from our sins and our captivity, and we have salvation for eternity with God, thanks to Jesus' sacrifice. So, it is okay to be filled with elation and remorse. And that's part of the mystery. That's part of the beauty of the mystery of communion. What is this that we are celebrating? How are we remembering Christ's body broken for us and His blood poured out as a sign of the new covenant? And what does it mean for us to eat it and drink it? I look forward to learning and understanding the significance of this every time we take it. So it is meaningful for me this morning to be able to lead us in communion. My first time, it seems really meaningful for me to be leading us in communion. And so I've chosen a way that I've never done before. I want to serve you each communion. I want to be the one that serves you communion. So how we're going to do communion this morning is the pastoral team will help me dismiss you and we'll have about 20 or 25 of you at a time come forward and we'll have the elements on the table. We'll have the the bread that are in baskets and the cups that are in our communion cups. They'll be on the tables. And the pastoral team will try to help get 20 to 25 of you 
just we'll work our way back to the sanctuary. You come forward, gather around the table. You may take the bread out of the basket yourself and get a cup yourself, but I will lead, I will lead you then in the words of institution of taking communion together. There are gluten-free crackers in the glass bowl for anyone that needs gluten-free. There are also bowls of grapes and crackers for the kids. So you can come up as families. Also, if you are not able to come up for whatever reason, the pastoral team will also bring the elements to you and also those in the sound booth and Pam playing piano or anyone in the nursery. So if, as you are able, as we move back to the sanctuary, we'll come forward and we'll do four or five of them as needed. And I will lead us through this time of communion. I also like to explain it this way, that we practice open communion. You do not have to be a member of our congregation to be able to take communion with us. As long as you profess Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're welcome to take communion here together. So kids, if you have not made that decision... If you've either not been baptized or if you've not made that decision that Jesus is Lord, if you've made the decision that Jesus is Lord of your life, you are, able, you are welcome to take communion, even if you haven't been baptized yet. But the kids and families, you can, you can help coordinate this too. If you have not gotten to that point, you can participate with grapes and crackers. And I encourage you kids, as you take the grapes, grapes and crackers, you think about what it means as you watch the adults that have the communion of the bread and the cup. And you can look forward to taking that communion as you get older. And then you make that decision to make Jesus your Lord and your Savior and become baptized and become a member of our church or a church. So at this time, I will invite the pastoral team to come up and help, dismiss you into groups of 20 or 25, and come and gather around, and you may pick up the bread and the cup, and then wait for me to, to lead you in communion this morning. Grab one of each. Come right up to the table so you're close and we know how many can fit. So if you have one. You can come around a little bit more. There's a, lot, a few more people coming up. Does everyone have bread or cup? And after Jesus prayed and gave thanks, he broke bread, 
and said, this is my body. Take and eat. You may take the bread. In the same way, he took the cup and said, this is my blood, a sign of the new covenant poured out for the forgiveness of your sins. You may drink. You may set your cups just on the table. Don't put them back in. You can set your cups on the table. You may go back and sit down. There's gluten crackers. If anyone needs gluten, that's in the crowd. Otherwise, there's crackers and grapes here for the children. would have bread and cup. And Jesus took the bread and he broke it and said, this is my body broken for you. You may take the bread. And in the same way, he took the cup and he said, this is my blood, a sign of the new covenant poured out for the forgiveness of your sins. You may take the cup. You may set the cups on the table. Return to your seats.
one of the most significant things that the Hebrew people did was eat together. And so they would eat together with other believers. And it was so meaningful to, to partake and sit down at a table and eat, whether it's bread or drinking wine, sitting at the table. It was meaningful. So for all of us to be together, to eat this together is so meaningful. And after Jesus prayed, he gave thanks and he broke the bread and he said, this is my body broken for you. You take the bread or the cracker. And in the same way, he took the cup. And he said, this is the blood, the sign of the new covenant. This is my blood poured out as a sacrifice for your sins. Let me take the cup. All right, you can set your cups on the table. Don't put them back in there. Just put them on the table. like this one. yourself. Lord, grab the bread and cup. Did you give some to Pam? Yeah. Take both. Just take both and just hold them. This is our last group. This is everyone. Everyone have the bread and the cup. I feel like quoting Jesus saying, I've longed to share this with you. Because I'm quoting Jesus in these words. And after he had given thanks, he took the bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body, broken for you. Take and eat. And in the same way, he took the cup and he said, this is my blood, a sign of the new covenant poured out for the forgiveness of your sins. Drink.
Let's set the cups here. You may make it the back too. We're going to sing I Am the Bread of Life, 472, in your blue hymnal. And I think we need to stand for this one. Please stand. now time for our announcements, sharing